a big ski to you all and welcome in to the phnx d-backs podcast right here on phnx my name is Derek Montia, occasionally known as your mayor, PHNX. And of course, I am joined by my vice mayor and your Thunderstick, occasionally known as Jesse Friedman. We just wanted to give a shout out to OG's Brands, the official sponsor of Flavoring Fridays. Head on over to ogsbrands.com to see their full lineup, including their two newest gummies, the OG's Naturals and the Big OG's, and find out where you can purchase them. And tell them Derek sent you, and they'll be like, oh, that guy? He's him again? Yeah, he keeps coming back and eating the big OGs. But anyway, Jesse, uh, you are not out at Salt River Fields. You were going to have a beautiful shot behind you, but then they had to go and play a college baseball game over there at Salt River Fields, preventing you from, you know, your your normal beautiful backdrop that you were going to institute. Yeah, some bunk about the Desert Invitational or some some college <laughs> some college baseball game that they've got going on. Uh, a ball almost took me out. By the way, I was trying it to did. set up out there to see if I could see if I could make it work. Uh, I told you it was a terrible idea. The, yeah, almost got pelted in the process. Um, yeah, yeah I, I think you know maybe there was a scenario where it would work, but uh, you know they got music no playing in between. And no scenario did it work. No, um, no. If if nothing more than your own personal safety, it was not going to work. You know, Mike Hazen even brought that up during his presser uh, where we were doing it outside, and when you know guys are throwing balls and doing stuff around you you're not safe you have no idea what's going to happen especially when your back is to the action but we did have lots of action out there at on day three of spring training they talk about it waning down and uh getting boring for us media jesse i must just be a baseball junkie because uh it was not boring it's still not boring to me it's still (laughs) beautiful weather and green grass and watching these guys uh, do PFPs and, and, and just be hanging out. I mean, we saw big crowd today, uh, on a Friday out there at Salt River Fields of fans. And it just felt, it felt wonderful to be out there watching these guys get ready to, to defend their national league crown. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you'll hear them use the word defend. That was, no, uh, they hate that. Up, yeah. They said, no, yesterday. Nope, do that. Yeah. Uh, which I don't, I mean, today, especially... kind of. You know, Mike, Mike brought up, he's like, yeah, we yeah. did that last year, but that mean it kind of means nothing now. And like, that's been the mantra a bit. Like we did that last year. It was special. We are proud of it, but that means nothing in 2024. We need to move on and, and try to get better as a team. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the Diamondbacks have, have the, the right view on this. Um, we have some clips from, from both Tori and Mike that we'll, we'll get to later in the show, but yeah, the the clear feeling around around you know the clubhouse and and in the front office and whatnot is that the Diamondbacks have to move on. They have to turn the page from all the success that they had last year. You know, as great as it was, there there was a time to enjoy it, and that time has kind of run its course at this point. It's time to turn the page. It's time to think about baseball in 2024. And the truth is, the Diamondbacks barely made the playoffs last year, and that you know they'd like to make it a little more comfortable this time around if they can. We do have some topics involving that, including Mike Hazen, I think, in my opinion, being a little hard on himself about the results of last year. Uh, but again, more focused on, you know, for versus celebrating last year, uh, moving forward and, and again, doing uh, achieving that ultimate goal in 2024. But we will get to that. Uh, more importantly, though, we have uh, not. Not not surprising, not shocking comments, but you could say I was a little surprised to hear uh, on day three of spring training camp before position players have even reported yet that Tori Lavallo has named Geraldo Perdomo his starting shortstop for 2024. Yeah, he just he just went out and did the thing. Uh, and this was, <laughs> a, this was a question that we kind of had coming into spring. It felt like there was a world possibly in which Jordan Lawler just comes in and absolutely rakes. And, you know, maybe he gets the starting shortstop job and that moves Geraldo Perdomo into a utility job that, you know, I think would, would suit him really well. But yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't the message coming from, uh, coming from Tori Lavello today. Nope. This is what Tori had to say in regards to Geraldo Perdomo being his starting shortstop. Uh, Perdomo is going to be our starting shortstop. He's earned that. Uh, he's earned that right. Um, I know that he's worked very hard on his right-handed swing. Um, so whether it's a left-handed backup or right-handed backup is undefined right now. I want to see what Jerry looks like coming into camp, and he deserves the opportunity to show me 
that he's able to handle a full 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 work workload um, as an everyday shortstop. So what does that number mean? 130 plus, 140 plus? I don't know, but that's going to be my starting point. Um, he's a great player, a really good player. That's growing. He's a great shortstop that's growing and learning um, offensively. So I want to give him that opportunity to show me, and then we'll f we'll fill in the gaps from there. That's exciting. Uh, and he's right. I think Geraldo Perdomo has absolutely earned that right. And I think, uh, you know, he he stepped up and was an incredible part of this team, not only all regular season last year, but even even though the results aren't what some of the other guys had, like it always felt like Perdomo was in the mix uh, in 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 making things happen during the playoffs and getting, you know, getting some sort of run going, getting the offense, you know, kickstarted. Yeah, I mean, you think you think what it was like a year ago with Geraldo Perdomo and Nick Ahmed coming into camp, and you know, we wondered if Nick Ahmed would kind of take over as as the full time shortstop, or whether they'd sort of split that role. That ultimately wound up wound up being the case out of out of spring training. You know, with Perdomo facing most of the righties, Ahmed facing most of the lefties. But yeah, I think the Diamondbacks want to at least give Perdomo, as you heard there, an opportunity to show what he can do against left-handed pitching last year you look at his splits he was substantially substantially better against righties than he was against lefties which isn't the worst thing in the world there's you know there's more right-handed pitchers out there than than lefties right. for sure uh, so right. you, you know you'd rather have it be that way than than the other way around but yeah it's you know it's not a universal thing that just because you're a switch hitter that doesn't necessarily mean that you're you know a, a good hitter against uh, both left-handers and right-handers and so the diamondbacks want to give perdomo an opportunity to prove that uh, I, I kind of, you know, I, I think it will still ultimately make sense for the backup at shortstop to be someone who bats right-handed. I'm not sure if I really see Perdomo, you know, elevating to the, to the point where you don't even feel the need to have a right-handed bat, uh, backing him up. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, you know, we also talked about Jace Peterson a little bit today and what positions he's going to get a look at. And Tori did say, I mean, it at least sounded like shortstop could be an option for him. Uh, you know, Kevin Newman, Jordan Lawler, of course, those would be backup shortstop options that bat right-handed Jace Peterson. If the Diamondbacks do, in fact, give him a look at short, he would become an option as a left-handed hitter. Um, so yeah, we'll see. Uh, we'll see how how that ultimately turns out with with the backup situation. But the Diamondbacks clearly believe in Geraldo Perdomo, and he is he is going to be the starting shortstop for this team. Let's be honest about what this means, most likely for Jordan Lawler, right? This means Jordan Lawler is probably going to start the season in AAA because you don't want Lawler backing up Perdomo. You don't want him getting such limited playing time and such limited at bats. You want him progressing and getting better every single day. So I feel like like Tory naming Perdomo the the starting shortstop this early. That's that's the one downside of it is uh, you know, we 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 know a lot of times that these battles aren't really battles in camp, but like I discussed yesterday, you never know when somebody is going to come up and outperform the guys that are supposed to get those roles and end up winning the job. So it 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 is kind of the downside to it, which feels like, you know, it's it's not even giving Lawler a chance be before position players even report to possibly win that starting shortstop job. He's right about Perdomo earning it, but I mean, what do you think? Do you think that essentially means that that's where Lawler's going to start? Yeah, we'll get into Hazen's comments on Lawler a little bit later. There was some interesting stuff there. But yeah, I mean, just hearing how hearing how emphatically Tori just comes out and says Geraldo Perdomo is the starting shortstop. Yeah, you I think I have to automatically believe that Jordan Lawler is most likely going to start the season in Reno. I mean, it's it's abundantly clear. I don't think we even had to hear anything from Tori or Mike to know that you want Jordan Lawler to get reps. You don't want Jordan Lawler right. to start on the opening day roster just to sit on the bench and, you know, maybe get one or two starts a week against lefties. That just doesn't serve you in the long term with a player that you view as a cornerstone player of the future, which I think is how the Diamondbacks still view Jordan Lawler. So, yeah, they called him up last year. You know, they gave him a look. They wanted to see if he could help them against lefties. He, he ultimately couldn't. Uh, I think that was a lot to ask Jordan Lawler, you know, being – uh, just as young as he is, he's not going to be, he's not going to reach the age that Corbin Carroll was when he was first called up until July of this year. Lawler is still quite a bit younger than Carroll was when, when he first got called up to the majors. So yeah, I think they were in position to at least give him a shot, uh, you know, last September. And, 
just because they gave him that shot doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, he instantly has a spot on the roster this season. It seems like it's going to serve him best in the long run to have him start the year in AAA. And then when he does look ready and he's able to, you know, he's able to show you uh, some some success uh, over over a longer period of time in Reno, then then you could bring him up at that point. We also had, I guess, uh, not not as scintillating of a comment today, considering he alluded to it yesterday. But Tori also once again reiterated that it sounds like Eduardo Rodriguez will be starting between Merrill Kelly and Zach Gallon, or should I say Zach Gallon and Merrill Kelly? It sounds like Erod will be the Diamondbacks' number two starting pitcher. Not that that means very much in the grand scheme of things. It's not like it's a demotion to Merrill Kelly or anything. It's it's <laughs> just as as Tori discusses here in this clip, it's breaking up the two righties, right? You go righty, lefty, righty now to start off, you know, a, especially a series where you're going to start the series with Zach Gallon. That's a that's a nice, you know, that's a nice change of looks to the opposing batters and and causes, you know, some some lineup problems for the opposing manager. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that I mean, I, I don't have a strong preference, honestly, on where Erod slots into the starting rotation for the Diamondbacks. I don't think it it really matters very much. I mean, you know, I think we we may be just just because Eduardo Rodriguez is n number two in the rotation doesn't necessarily mean that he's the number two starter in a sense or like the second right. best starter on the right. team. Right. You right. very well could still be like, yeah, well, Merrill Kelly is the second best starter on the team. Maybe the Diamondbacks believe that Merrill Kelly is the second best starter on this team, but you might want to deploy them in that way. If it were me, I would probably still just have Zach and Merrill one and two. I think that puts you in, in the best position in the long run to you know, have them make as many starts as possible as opposed to the other guys. But Correct. I mean, yeah, there's still going to be opportunities to reshuffle things throughout the year. It doesn't really matter the way that they start it, and it doesn't really matter over the course of the year how that unfolds. Once you get through the first couple turns of the rotation, you know, the way that you're matching up with other teams, it's not like your number two starters always facing the other team's number two starter. That goes out the right. window pretty right. quick. Right. So it it just it just doesn't matter very much at the end of the day. I, I do know, and, and like this was the point I was trying to make yesterday, is like with the, the with the workload Merrill Kelly had and the and the medical issues he had, which weren't medical issues that are of concern. They're just medical issues that are from you know uh, like the cramping and and the blood clots and things like that. Things that you want him to get a little bit more rest, and maybe moving him to third also provides that less starts for Merrill Ke Kelly. I know you said you want more, but it like at least it just kind of puts a little less, you know, on his body potentially, uh, especially after what we saw last year. But this is what Tori had to say about uh, Eduardo Rodriguez coming into spring camp and and that where he might start in the rotation. Um, everything that I remember from, from the days where we were together in Boston, um, a very hungry player, uh, a very eager player, somebody that wants to learn and grow, ask questions, accepting of coaching. And I think he has a, a very competitive mean streak in him that shows up every fifth day. So we haven't seen that yet, but that's what I remember. And I'm really excited that he's here. He chose us. You know, he had an opportunity to go in a lot of different directions, but the fact that he chose us means a lot to me. Um, yeah, I mean, er, early on, probably right in the middle of, of the first two righties. But we'll, we'll figure that out. we got to see how the – the opposing teams we're facing are lining up, stacking up lineup wise. Um, I mean, every team there's moving parts with them right now. So we got to figure out as the roster start to get a little bit more defined um, for the teams that we're going to be playing, we'll start to figure out where that slice is. So again, nothing, nothing there that's set in stone, but it just sounds like based on matchups and such, you know, Tori, Tori could decide where Erod goes. Like you said, it's not, uh, anything meaning Merrill Kelly, you know, is not still their number two or or even one A one B with Zach Gallon, right? Those guys have been outstanding sure. for this team, but they both had a short off season, and as it stands right now, Erod is coming in as a strong starting pitcher uh, who is rested and and ready to go for this team. So it would be smart to utilize him early on. Uh, I mean, as crazy as it sounds. Maybe even, you know, have starting him number one. I mean, it really doesn't matter. Like you said, it's really not a matter of 
when you when you end up facing other teams that you're actually facing number one faces number one number two faces number two so anything right now that can maybe give those guys a little extra rest after uh you know what they put their arms through in 2023 isn't isn't the worst idea right now yeah i mean the d-backs opened the season against the rockies so you know they might as well just call up a few guys from triple a have See, them you get it the first few you get the it yes and then you can you know you can bring in zach uh, merrill and erod uh, once you the, really need them the first series erod <laughs> bryce jarvis and then i don't know uh human lynn I, i'm just throwing it out there <laughs> whatever but uh there's there's a lot of arms you know and and that was cool we got to see human lynn by the way i i i i, I don't fan out about a lot of players but i was like oh, there he is it's it's him you know but uh there's <laughs> there's a lot of excitement out there um big shout out to everybody that listens to this show that we got to meet for the first time today uh and sorry to brett who is just taking pictures of us from afar who for some reason <laughs> how did we not like bump into brett or hear brett at any point like that's yeah. crazy that we didn't at hear least brett hear brett at, some point. at least yeah. hear brett yeah you can usually uh, hear brett from about a mile away so i'm not i'm not uh, sure how that happened but that was very funny brett was in was yeah. in the discord like asking us oh who's this guy who's this guy and i'm like Brett, are you here? <laughs> yeah. And then sure enough, I th I'm pretty sure we could spot Brett from a distance. So we didn't, we didn't get to say hi, unfortunately. So uh, next yeah, time. that was, that was, uh, that, it was, there was a lot of people out there for sure. A lot of people. And uh, of course, Tori and Mike, they've both been fairly honest. It's, it's, it's a tall task for them to see everybody on this team, especially Mike. He was just straightforward. Like I'm not watching anything. I'm just hanging out, talking to the writers, but uh, Tori uh, did uh, talk about who stood out so far in spring uh, as far as like velocity wise and, and arms that have kind of popped up on, on his radar. Damon, we have that clip. that clip. We playing that clip. <laughs> I will say overall the summary of what I'm seeing is a lot of velocity. And I said that last year and it's probably spiked up a little bit more from last year. So, um, you know, it was 92, 93 plus last year. Um, now it's 95, 97 up to a hundred plus that I'm watching in some of our bullpen. So some really hot arms. I just want to see that um, translate into strikes, pitchability, and consistency. I know I know about some of those 100-mile-per-hour arms, Jesse. Uh, I've heard about them. I know Mike Hazen brought up Justin Martinez saying, you know, that once his uh, – you know, once his arm can get things a little bit under control, that that is going to be somebody I think that is going to be a very valuable member of the bullpen for this team. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it does feel like the Diamondbacks are fairly stacked with some of the players that are returning from injury, like Corbin Martin, some of the new acquisitions, and, and even some of the young guys that you and I are getting to see for the first time in person up here at, at camp. Yeah, we are gonna need we're gonna need Tori to spill the beans on who he's talking about. Uh, because that that was just that was an unreasonable comment, right? He's gonna tell us that someone's 92, 93, and then now they're 95 to 97, all the way up 95 to 100, 100. But, he doesn't, who? but he doesn't actually who? tell us who? who they are. Yeah, who uh, is it? I feel like we have to like like if you could if you could pick someone to be that player, who would you pick? Like who comes to mind is like, oh, I would love to see that player throw 97. You know, like what is what does that look like? How does that change their game? I guess like I know, Tommy Henry comes to mind for me. I, I was gonna say I know Ryan Nelson had a very good fastball, but what was his velocity on his fastball? He was like he yeah, up I think that high? he averaged he averaged like 94-ish last year. So that would be that would be an, a slight uptick for him. But if he's talking about someone who was 92, 93 last year, I don't think it'd be Ryan Nelson. I would think it yeah. would be uh, maybe. I mean, Bryce Jarvis, I think, was into the mid 90s last spring. So I don't know if that would, Tommy if that Henry, would make a ton of sense. If you're telling me Tommy Henry is hitting 100 miles per hour, just <laughs> stop right now. Like, give him the starting rotation spot now. The man already had... <laughs> the lowest exit below for, you know, bat batters of, of any pitcher on the staff. So like, I, I just, I, I think Tommy Henry is one of those guys that was really held back momentarily by injury. You know, he discussed with us yesterday that he was ready to go in, in, in the playoffs and in the world series, but it's understandable for the diamondbacks not to call on him and expect him to, you know, 
come in and, and be able to perform in, in that big of a, of a stage, you know, like just as, as coming back from injury like that. So I, I think yeah. he is a guy that we could potentially see uh, do big things because he, he already felt last year, like, you know, there was a lot of talk about Dre Jameson. There was a lot of talk about Ryan Nelson and somehow Tommy Henry kind of became the bit, the, the more consistent of those two guys, as far as his performances, when he would start for this team. Uh, people are speculating a bit in the comments fought, I think is actually like, like I could, I could maybe see that being the case. Uh, you know, if Brandon fought is up into the mid nineties this spring, that would certainly be a development. Uh, Zach gallon, uh, uh, someone, uh, who is this? This is Brandon, uh, could be gallon. He's set 92 to 93, but I've seen him hit 97 before. True. I think I'd be a little concerned, honestly, if Zach gallon was pumping hundred miles an hour in bullpen <laughs> sessions when the diamondbacks <laughs> are intentionally telling him to like, take it a little bit slow. And spring. That'd be such a Zach uh, gallon thing to do though. That would be a negative development. Actually, <laughs> that would be, that would be being Zach Gallon if that was the case. Probably the same with Merrill. Uh, um, but yeah, you know, if if and and I think Michael is right. There might be some you know some embellishing happening here. Uh, you know, is is you know th these are bullpen sessions. It's a little bit different pitching. It's like he took an uptick. Game. He's throwing 97, 98, 104. I mean, it was just wild. They're like, wait, did you? <laughs> Did you say 104? What where yeah. did you stick that? 112? In? What? Yeah. <laughs> uh yeah. So maybe, maybe there's not a whole lot to this, but uh I I did I am still dying to know, like, you know, who are the like one or two names or whatever it was that he yeah. had in his mind when he was thinking that, because there are some pitchers in the system where if they do, you know, see an uptick in their velo from the low 90s to the mid upper 90s. That would be obviously a huge development. Could be a reliever as well. It doesn't. I don't necessarily think this has to be a starting pitcher. Uh, there's a kind of a longer list of guys do who that could be. But hopefully, we'll we'll get Tori to tell us who he's talking about uh, sooner sooner than later. No, it's all mind games. I think Josh Hunt said that in the in the <laughs> chat. It's all mind games. But uh, there was a lot of talk when when you talk about the mindset of this team and and how the Diamondbacks are viewing 2024 about setting a standard versus setting expectations or about expectations changing. And, you know, we, we know that expectations are drastically different this season, obviously. And I think that would have been the case had they just even made the playoffs and maybe just won their first series, right? Like the success in the playoffs does raise your expectations considering the Diamondbacks made it all the way to the world series, those expectations might be a little outlandish at this point, but I do feel like the team has gotten better. I think that they're going to have a faster start. I think they addressed a lot of their weaknesses. So there's no reason to not think that this team can come back in 2024 and be a better team than they were in 2023. Uh, you know, and, and Tori talked about setting that standard versus setting expectations when asked about, you know, how to manage those expectations of the players and and everyone else involved, front office, you know, fans, all of that. And this is what Tori had to say. We're going to talk about a standard rather than an expectation. I think that's a good way to avoid that because um, expectations can become burdensome. You know, you look at them, you set them up, and then you, you start to achieve something that um, may or may not be attainable. Uh, and it might create a limitation. So I'm going to talk about a standard. We have we have raised the bar here considerably over the past two years. Uh, last year we went to the World Series, and we're very proud of that. So yes, uh, there are some achievements, but we are going to strive that to get to that standard every single day and continue to raise that bar. I feel like that th that creates a ceiling that is that is unknown and something that that you can continually strive for that's really unachievable that that'll lead you to some really special moments. I love what he said there because this team right now has built a foundation on youth. They have young players and those young players were who performed so well last year in the playoffs that got them as far as, as they got, you know, and, and Mike Hazen spoke about how impressed he was with guys coming up big in those moments. And he singled out Alec Thomas's home run against Craig Kimbrell. He talked about Corbin Carroll hitting that big home run against the Brewers that kind of just shifted the momentum in that game. But the the idea here is, is that Tori Lovello and Mike Hazen can set a standard that these young players can follow and establish as a standard of excellence for this team going forward, right? For new guys to come on and learn. It's, it's that weird thing that teams 
in the past that have won a bunch of championships and other sports and stuff talk about, right? Like the Patriot way and all of that kind of stuff, which there you go. Mike Hazen, who's a big fan of the Patriots. I know he'll, he'll yeah. love that, but uh, you know, that's the thing is leadership obviously must define what that standard is. And considering that they got as far as they did last year, I feel like the buy-in is easier for these young players to, you know, un- understand what Tori is trying to do here and and be fully on board with it you know i i it's it it is a time now to kind of set the definition for this period of diamondbacks baseball and and what this franchise could be over the next five years plus yeah i think for the diamondbacks if they were coming into spring training and they were expecting to win 95 games this year that might not be the healthiest way to to view the situation. I, I understand where Tori is coming from. It kind of feels like semantics a, a little bit. I, I do think that setting a standard and you know expectations kind of go hand in hand. We heard Zach Gallen the other day. I believe he used yeah. the word expect. He said, we expect yeah. to make the playoffs every year. I think that that does come along with setting a higher standard for yourself. But if you're a player, you probably want to view it in terms of you know the process of, of getting there. Um, and that's, you know, that's where that standard perspective kind of, you know, comes into play where you're thinking of, all right, this is, this is who we are as a team, you know, that we are a, we are a team that does things at a very high level and you kind of use that to motivate yourself and the results are sort of, you know, the results come uh, from that. Uh, so yeah, it, it feels like a little bit of, you know, there's some managerial speak, some, uh, there you know, is, there I can is, understand, but a- I can understand where they're coming from. It's a mindset thing, right? And yeah, like you said, the expectations is an upward trajectory, right? What's the next logical thing to happen? We had a 17% increase, so we'll have another 17% increase. That's not the way baseball goes, right? But what, what they do know is that losing one more game last year meant that they didn't make the playoffs, Losing a handful of games, you know, maybe not having the April that they had, maybe not coming out of the gate. Right. So like there is a a matter of understanding what Diamondbacks baseball is, and that's more manager speak for you. I know you love that. We heard Tori use that a lot last year, right? Like they'd lose a game and he would say that wasn't Diamondbacks baseball tonight. And you kind of sit there maybe wondering, like, what the hell is Diamondbacks baseball? Like, what does that even mean? Right. That's the standard he's trying to set where there is a certain expectation of what Diamondbacks baseball is. And I think, like I like I said a moment ago, like getting as far as you did, you know, it's kind of like yesterday when we were talking about him convincing Zach and Merrill to maybe not give him so much shit when he pulls him out of the game, right? Like, yes, they say they're going to be better about it. Are they going to be? Probably not. But at the very least, maybe based on the way things went last year, they understand a bit more why Tori's trying to save them for a later time rather than let them go out there and throw 120 ga- uh, pitches in a game in May. You know what I mean? Like that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. So like there's sometimes where the success and seeing the success as a player makes you buy in on what that manager is trying to have you do or, or whatever he's, he's asking of you as a player. So I, I do feel like that the, the, if they, if they approach this carefully, right. And that feels like what they're doing, they can, motivate these guys in a way to stay hungry and want more than just getting to a world series and being able to pat themselves on the back about that. They want to be there in the conversation every year. And there are certain teams like that, right? Like the Cardinals are one of those teams where last year they were just shockingly bad because of course they're the Cardinals. So everybody picks them to win the division or at least be in the playoffs. And then the next year, even though they didn't make it last year and were kind of underwhelming and, and, I don't know, arguably didn't do a whole lot to really improve themselves in a dramatic way uh, are still picked to make the playoffs again this year. That's because Cardinals baseball has set a standard for what they are. And people are of the belief they'll always be back there and be competitive almost every single year. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's what the Diamondbacks are looking for, at least in this current era, because of how talented these young players are and how developed their core is how many guys are part of that core and how they're continuing to build around it. These off season additions are, are, are great. But as it was brought up in the press conference today, it remains to be seen how, how much they improve the team and how much better this team is. You, you don't know until we take the field yeah. and start playing regular season baseball games. So I, I just, I, I really like 
what we're hearing so far. And I, I do think that they're doing a good job of trying to manage those expectations in a different way so that they don't become cumbersome like he's talking about, where you don't find yourself being disappointed that the team doesn't win 90 you know, five games in 2024 because you expect them to win 95 games in 2024, right. you know, but you're right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's hard. It's hard not to still say like, we expect to do this. We expect to do that. Those are expectations. And we're going to hear them continue to use that word. But I think Tori's going to try to continue to change their mindset. Like he did with the, you know, co connected and dangerous mindset that he's kind of <laughs> spread amongst his players, you know? Yeah, I think results-based expectations just in general comes with a lot of pressure, uh, you know, and yeah. I think you can put a yeah. little bit too much pressure on yourselves, especially a Diamondbacks team that is still very young. You know, a lot of the players who are really playing key roles on this team in, in 2024, they're, they are really young players. And, you know, if you're a younger player in this league who finds himself pressing early on in the season, that's that's not a great place to be. So I think especially given where, some of these guys are in their careers. It's important to make sure everyone's on the same page mentally, you know, how we want to, how we want to approach this going into this season. You could argue that that pressure is what helped the Diamondbacks win in the playoffs last year, because those expectations were all on their opposition. It was all on the opposing right. teams. They were all expected to beat the Diamondbacks. All of the, all the weight of the world was on them. The Diamondbacks were just I mean, I'm not like, obviously they weren't just happy to be there, but like the Diamondbacks were just playing in a way where they were playing with house money. We use that phrase house money a lot in the, in the playoffs last year, but you know, getting there and, and getting to a point where you win your first series and now you're taking on these teams that are all expected to be there. They're all expected to beat you. It was the, the pressure was on them and not on the Diamondbacks. That's not going to be the case this year coming back as the reigning defending national league champions whether you want to admit you're that whether you would want to acknowledge that whether you think that's even a thing you are the reigning defending national league champions and people are going to play differently when they play against the diamondbacks in 2024 it's not going to be the same game plan yeah. as 2023 you know it's not going to yeah, be I, what the dodgers said it's not going to be the world series every time you play the diamondbacks but they're they're definitely going <laughs> to come to play when they when they play the d-backs I think Tyler makes a good point in the chat too. Uh, it seems like every year we've come in with expectations. We didn't reach them. It's a very real thing. The yeah, Diamondbacks exactly. and, and this, I think this even predates Tori Lovello's tenure here, but it has been kind of a thing during his tenure as well in seasons where the Diamondbacks were expected to, to be good coming off, you know, a strong year. They, they really haven't been right. 2018, yeah. uh, the team uh, was in first place throughout the majority of the year and then really, really struggled in September. The Dodgers wind up winning the division instead that of course, coming off their, their run in 2017, which looked very promising. Uh, you know, in 2019, the diamondbacks had a, a strong year kind of bouncing back they won 85 games. Uh, they add some pieces. And then in 2020, obviously a very uh, weird year for a lot of different reasons, but it was not a good one for, for the Diamondbacks. Um, and then here we are again, right? Where the Diamondbacks, they've they've had lower expectations the last couple of years, but now we're back to a point where people are expecting them to be a good baseball team. I think I saw the Athletic had the Diamondbacks seventh, uh, you know, in their early spring training power rankings. Like there, there are some expectations on this team and, you know, you want to control mentally how you're, how you're approaching that in the clubhouse for sure. Benjamin Hundley says no one in the national media is treating the D backs like reigning national league champs. That's yeah, fine. That's fair. Yeah, that's yeah. fair. Uh, but that's not how teams are going to approach them. I don't believe so. And if they are, then they're foolish. They are foolish if they approach them like that. But anyway, uh, we do thank all of you for your comments. Thank you for being here on the PHN exports YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet. What are you waiting for? Do so now. Sign up for notifications. That way you don't miss when all of our wonderful shows go live. Leave us a like. We always appreciate that. If you're listening on the audio podcasting side, we love our listeners. Of course, make sure you're subscribed over there. Leave us a five-star review. We always appreciate those as well. Of course, if you are stopping in at Salt River Fields or leaving Salt River Fields or just driving around the valley, make sure to stop by Circle K. There is one near you, and it is America's Thirst Stop right now. Of course, if you join their Inner Circle program for free by downloading the Circle K app today, uh, terms and conditions apply at participating locations. Visit circlek.com for details. Uh, but if you do, if you do join 
their inner circle program for free. You can save 25 cents off per gallon on your first five Phillips. You'll also save three cents off per gallon every day after that. You'll get all sorts of wonderful fun, fun coupons in the app, as well as buy five, get a sixth one free on a selection of Circle K products like pizza, coffee, and ice cold fountain drinks. So sign up today, become part of the family, join the inner circle now. Also, we have our friends over at Prize Picks, which is the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America, uh, and it is the easiest and most exciting way to play DFS. You might have heard my voice at times at the beginning of the show talk about Prize Picks. I love Prize Picks uh, because instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks and people that know way more about baseball than even Jesse, uh, you can pick more than or less than on two to six players, stats and combos, uh, project projections. You just watch them, uh, watch the winnings roll in. Uh, and of course, prize pick is really simple to play. You can make all of your picks and submit your entry in less than 60 seconds. So go to prizepicks.com slash PHNX and use code PHNX for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash PHNX and use code PHNX. Daily fantasy sports made easy. Jesse, is Mike Hazen being fair on his, to himself about the results of last year? I feel like um, he did acknowledge the achievement. He did say that he was proud of what they accomplished, but he also picked apart uh, their season a little bit. And I think he was, he was, he was pretty, uh, pretty to the point about it, but I think he was pretty honest about how last year goes. We talked about it just a moment ago, but if the Diamondbacks lose one more game. They don't even make that playoff run because they don't even make the playoffs. So uh, let's, what, what, what were your thoughts? Let, let, uh, let's, let's hear what Mike Hazen had to say, and then I'll, I'll see what you think if he's being fair to himself. We won 84 games last year. I mean, we got in, we, we were the last team into the playoffs. That, that's not really a sustainable position to put the team in, um, in terms of wanting to get to the playoffs every year. You know, we, we got in a day or two left in the season. That's not a position I want to be in moving forward. Um, we were the last team in. We, were, we only won 84 games. I mean, I mean that's where we, and the way we played for the first three months of the season, I think we're better than that as a team, frankly. Um, so we're looking to build on all those reasons, ways. Some of that was depth and roster and clearly my responsibility. Um, and I'm very much aware of the things that I need to do to improve in those areas and, and, and we'll continue to focus on that. And I think from Tori and I talking and the coaches that, you know, from an execution standpoint, we everybody has the opportunity to improve and be better than they were, no matter how good of a season they had last year. And, I think that's the message. Tori's talked about that standard. We've talked about um, holding that standard in a place that is worthy of being a perennial playoff contender. And I think that's where we're 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 going to shoot for. Being fair, I mean, this is, feels like a, a Jesse Friedman assessment of last year a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean. I think I think it is fair in the sense of you don't want to do that again, right? Like you don't yeah. want to be the can't last gamble team. on 84. Yeah. Yeah, you can't gamble on 84. That's a great way of putting it. The Diamondbacks, if they win 84 games again in 2024, they very well might not make the playoffs. I mean, there was a time not too far from the end of the season. We were trying to figure out how many wins it would take to get into the playoffs. And we were thinking high 80s for a while there. A lot of those teams kind of yeah. struggled toward the end. And it, it lowered a threshold of what you needed to get in. Diamondbacks very much benefited from that. You can't count on that happening again, for sure. Uh, so, yeah, I think in terms of, you know, assessing where the Diamondbacks need to be in 2024 to be able to make the playoffs again, you know, I, I absolutely agree with Mike's assessment. I think at the same time, you know, he's he's assessing himself as if the Diamondbacks went into 2023 as, you know, a surefire playoff team that you know wound up just kind of squeaking in at the last second and that wasn't really the situation going into 2023 like the diamondbacks even themselves yeah. were talking about wanting to play relevant games in september wanting to buy at the trade deadline you know those are boxes that that they checked but they ultimately far exceeded the expectations um you know they made the playoffs and then obviously everything they accomplished from from that point forward so yeah i i see where mike is coming from and and i agree that in 2024 like you know, you're playing, you're playing with fire a little bit. If you don't 
uh, you know, if you don't make some improvements to the team and, and the D backs did make some improvements, but you know, they were, a, they were a minus 15 run differential team last year. Like they, uh, other teams scored more runs against them than they scored. Uh, so I think, you know, they the improvements that they made were, were very much necessary. Well, if he has his way, the diamondbacks will still add that right-handed bat. He continues to get asked for it. We have no news, but here's what he said about adding a right-handed bat to this lineup. I don't have anything to report on that, but yes, we're still, there's still players in the market and we're still, Ken has still um, told me to continue to improve the team any way that we can um, within the, the, the bounds that we kind of have. And, and so we're still out there actively trying to do that. When I hear him say that, I just think of Ken handing him the credit card and being like, here you go. It's the, the corporate account. Go <laughs> get, get whoever you need. Right. Like, I mean, uh, it is encouraging that they're still looking and we know that there are still some names available. Uh, it's not very encouraging about how much we think some of those names are going to cost. So it kind of, I feel like limits who, who they could still be looking at, but we discussed Tommy Pham. We know that Grich is one of the, uh, possible additions. You know, we talked about Adam Duvall. So those guys are still affordable and they're still out there. We haven't heard any news on those guys getting signed yet. So I, I'm sure the Diamondbacks will still add one of those guys or maybe a mystery person that we aren't even discussing before, you know, they start playing baseball games. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see that happen here before too long. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's totally possible. Uh, yeah, I was Mark finds who initially came out with that report, tying them to those three names that you mentioned. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's something that clearly makes sense for the team. We talked about the roster construction and how it, it's a little unclear what they would do right now against lefties. You probably don't want to start Jock Peterson in that situation. The team really would benefit from adding a right-handed bat. And we're, I mean, we're at the point now, I know the, you know, the Boris clients are still out there and certainly not, you know, I don't think their price tags are necessarily going down too much. Um, but we are at the point where guys want to play, like guys don't want to sit out and miss spring training with their new teams. And, right. you know, you wonder, especially, you know, if you're, if you're Jordan Montgomery, if you're Blake Snell, that's one thing, but you know, if you're an Adam Duvall or Randall Grishik who really wants to figure out like where you're going to be playing baseball this year, maybe the maybe the asking price on some of these guys comes down. I imagine that's probably what the Diamondbacks are waiting for, and it doesn't seem too far fetched that that could happen not too long from now. Well, we speculate that Jordan Lawler will be starting the year with the Reno Aces, but we have no confirmation of that. Uh, but here is what Mike Hazen had to say about Jordan Lawler possibly making the team and, you know, their thoughts on, on his future. Yeah, there's gotta be, there's gotta be a role. I mean, I think his performance last year was, he did a good job defensively for sure. I think the, from a bat standpoint, I think there's still some growth that needs to happen. Um, and, but he's gonna, he's gonna figure that out pretty quickly and he's gonna come out here and compete. And, um, I, we want, we need to have him, he's too good of a player to not be playing. He needs to play. Um, and, and that might be with us. It might not be. Um, but I, we think he's going to have the chance to be a stud in this league for a long time. And part of what we're going to be as an organization today and moving forward. And, you know, we'll see how spring training goes. Let's talk about that part where he said with us, or it might not be Okay. Yeah. That means the Reno Aces, you guys. I just wanted to tell our <laughs> producer, Jacob, that. I wanted to let all the guys in our group chat know that. I wanted to let everybody know to calm down and not panic because he doesn't mean that they're going to get rid of Jordan Lawler. He just means that he's either going to be playing with the Diamondbacks or he's going to be playing you know, with with the Reno Aces or, or somewhere else in their organization where he's going to be getting regular at-bats. I, I think the writing is on the wall here between Torrey naming Geraldo Perdomo the starting shortstop and them saying that Jordan Lawler needs to play regularly and he needs, you know, regular at bats that he's going to most likely start triple A. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, no GM and particularly Mike Hazen from what I've gotten to know about him over the years 
is no one is going to come out and say like you know this, <laughs> such and such player might play for us or he might not you know might like, play for someone no else one, who knows no it's one, baseball no baby one is going to, no <laughs> one's going to dip their hand like that on a trade so i feel very confident saying mike Hazen is not at all alluding to a trade of jordan lawler although we will be keeping a close eye on jordan lawler's instagram because that's something we like to yeah do i was gonna him. say you're gonna uh, act like we didn't go crazy <laughs> over an instagram post for ronaldo <laughs> perdomo let's be real here uh let's be real but yeah it's hard to square, you know, between Tori saying Geraldo Perdomo, you know, saying emphatically Geraldo Perdomo is our starting shortstop. Mike saying, you know, he's too good of a player. Talking about Lawler, he's too good of a player not to play. And then Mike saying he could play with the D-backs or he could play, you know, down in AAA. Putting all those things together, it only makes sense for Jordan Lawler to start the year in AAA. There just isn't really a scenario in my mind where the Diamondbacks could have him and Perdomo on the opening day roster with Perdomo as the primary everyday shortstop and Lawler still getting regular opportunity. Now that Eugenio Suarez is in the organization, third right. base is covered. Right. You know, I guess I guess if an injury arises, that would be the one situation where yeah, a spot obviously. could come up for Lawler to play. But if that doesn't happen, there's no way for Lawler to get everyday reps, you know, with Perdomo being the primary guy at shortstop. That's the key is we all kind of slotted Lawler at times over at third base. We thought of that maybe being our solution last year. We know it wasn't great. It wasn't ideal, but it's still a way to get him in the lineup and maybe solve the Diamondbacks third base issue. Now their third base issue has been solved and you're not going to like, again, Gino, as much as you want to, you're not going to play 162 games in a Tori Lavola lineup, but uh, you he is going to play regularly. And I mean, like Tori talked about, you know, uh, uh, Geraldo Perdomo, them not knowing the number, but 130, 140, something like that. I imagine something similar for Gino as well. I know he's a little bit older, uh, but I'm sure Gino is going to start the fair, fair share of games over there at third base. So I think that that's going to limit, you know, the, the idea here that maybe – Lawler could back up Perdomo and also back up third base and get time at both. I just think that they want to continue to develop him at this point. He showed that he can play defense at a major league level, and we know that. And we know that his his bat is good. We just need him to continue getting better and and be you know be able to contribute on both sides of the ball. Uh, walk off sports talk in the chat says, "Would you guys hate it if we use Jordan to get a top pitcher?" Oh, here we go. Uh, I don't, I don't know if any team is really making a trade of that magnitude at this point in the off season. So I, I don't really see that happening no matter what. I think it, I, de it I, would depend I on the pitcher, right? I, I, yeah. Like I kind of do, but it depends on the situation, right. And the scenario, I just, you know, if, if you wanted to use Corbin Burns as a, as an example, no, I don't really want to mortgage the future for one season of Corbin Burns. And that really is what it comes down to for me. Uh, I think that Jordan Lawler, you know, is very important to this team in the future. I think that, you know, the Diamondbacks have been quick to pull that trigger in the past. And, you know, we we still have people that talk about Dansby Swanson. We still have people that talk about, you know, some of the guys that we've moved on from. It's usually when we lose the trade because, you know, people don't talk about Jazz nearly as much considering a guy as Zach Gallon. You know, but, I mean, again, you're not going to be able to pull off many trades where you're going to get the equal value of what Jordan Lawler could be uh for from a starting pitcher and if you are most likely it's going to be a short-term you know kind of a, a pitcher on a short-term deal right so I, I i don't like that because i think right now the diamondbacks are in a mode where they can kind of you know keep their their you know keep their current momentum going and they can keep their current guys in their system i think guys are going to want to continue to play for this team so you know uh, we're we're going to see more erods where they choose the diamondbacks as a free agent to come over here and play with sure. guys like corbin carroll and alec thomas and you know zach and and merrill and such so uh i i i'm i'm against that kind of trade right now but i that's only because i feel yeah. like they have a fairly complete lineup as it is you know yeah uh, and they, i mean lawler's such a big part of of their future plans i think too like if the diamondbacks want to be the perennial like 90 95 win team you know, having another young star emerge would be a really, really big part of yeah. that. And Jordan Lawler, more than anyone else in this organization right now, looks like he could be that guy. So, you you know, you don't really want to give up on him. I mean, I don't think you'd be giving up on him to trade him right now. But, uh, you, yeah, you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you're trading away someone like that who has a chance to be a star for a fairly long period of time for you in exchange for, you know, two years of Dylan Cease or 
you know, what, whatever, whatever it might be with, with that's a given a good pitcher. I, that's a good example. Just, you're, you're that's just a little more so tempting, for a pitcher. but I just don't, still don't want it. I still don't want it, but that is a little more, a little more tempting. Um, we do have more from Mike on not adding more to this bullpen during the off season. And it's something yeah. we spoke about. We, we thought that maybe a bullpen move might be imminent where they might pick up somebody or, or even make a trade for another bullpen arm. This is what Hazen had to say about the bullpen. Yes, we did make that decision. Uh, I, I think where we felt like we lost all of our free agents was in was in the lineup for the most part. And I've already talked about my feelings on where we saw like the rotation and what last year. So we, we and we spent a significant amount of our resources in both of those areas to do it. Um, we have a lot of good the balance for us in going and getting established reliever versus taking some of these young arms and giving them opportunity to come up into our pen. Uh, that's kind of a balance we had in the back end of our bullpen from the closer on down, which was something that we hadn't solved in years past, but we did last deadline. Um, and where Ginkle solidified Thompson and our lefties, et cetera, Castro, McGuff coming back, we just, we felt like that was more of a strategic play for us. Certainly we want to continue to build out that area because we know the bullpen that we have today, probably don't have three weeks from now. Um, once we get into the season, we will through spring training, I'm hopeful, but April wise, and that's just the nature of the bullpen sometimes and dealing with the volume and the injuries and things like that. So. They do have a lot of good arms and there's a lot of good arms returning. Like you said, Scott McGuff is another name. We also have uh, Corbin Martin, who was kind of an unknown, you know, they talked about he was on the trajectory to make the team last year before his horrific, you know, tendon injury. And, you know, that's something that, we, we don't know how he's going to factor and how good he's going to be. Uh, we talked about Luis Frias still having that option so he could end up uh, in AAA, obviously, and the Diamondbacks would have an opportunity to maybe develop him a little more and make room for somebody else that wins that spot. But um, the yeah. answer, the, the question he was answering was, was it was, was it a decision to not add to the bullpen? And, and he confirmed it was. And they doesn't sound like you know that's in their plans with the guys that they currently have on their roster. Yeah. I mean, we had, you know, we had wondered if the diamondbacks do go get a right-handed bat and, you know, maybe that makes it. So Jake McCarthy's role on the team isn't, isn't as clear. He probably would become minor league depth at that point, at least based on the roster they have that, that would be my expectation. Um, you know, does that be, does he become a trade candidate for a relief pitcher? Maybe, uh, I guess we can't rule that out entirely, but it does sound from what Mike said there that the Diamondbacks have made a pretty conscious decision. Like bullpen isn't an area we really need to address. Uh, and, and to be fair, bullpens are also probably the easiest thing to address at the trade deadline. You know, if you, if you run up to the trade deadline and your bullpen is okay, but it's not great, that's something that can be fixed at the trade deadline, you know, and you're going to, you're going to pay a premium. That's kind of how it always is that time of year, but you're still going to be able to get, you know, what, what you probably need at that point. So maybe that's the diamondbacks plan kind of in the, you know, what they're not saying is that the team is, is prepared to do that or kind of maybe expects to do that come the trade deadline if the team is in that position. But uh, yeah, it, I I've said this before. I, I think, I, I think it's something that that is pretty important. Like I, I don't view this Diamondbacks bullpen as being, um, you know, top notch necessarily. I think it's right around the middle of the league. Uh, I definitely hear what Mike is saying about wanting to add or wanting to leave room, I should say, for some of those younger guys to come in. Right. But this right. Diamondbacks team is, I mean, they're they're trying to contend. They're trying to do the thing. They don't they don't have quite as much, uh, you know, patience, quite as much margin for you know, younger players to come up and, and struggle a little bit. So it's a balancing act for sure. Uh, hopefully Kevin Ginkle stays healthy and, and this elbow thing doesn't, doesn't turn into anything big. Uh, Cause yeah. he, as we talked about yesterday, that would, that would be a pretty, pretty big blow to this so team valuable. for sure. Yeah, it really would. And it, it's not to say they couldn't have guys fill in, in in the meantime, but it would be a big loss right away. Uh, and, and yeah, there's other unknowns, right? We know that Tommy Henry or Ryan Nelson are going to, uh, end up in the bullpen possibly True. i don't know if they're yeah, going to go point. that route i mean bryce yep. jarvis there's a lot of other arms that factor in here I, I i do understand though that with limited resources on improving this team there were bigger areas to address like the fact that they literally didn't have enough starting pitchers 
uh, to to play in in the playoffs last year, right? So you know you you wanted to make sure you address that. You wanted to address that in a big way. They got the guy that they were have been pursuing for a while. You know that Tori has had that connection with Erod, and again, it's a guy that wanted to come here, right? Like it's not through a trade. It's it's a guy that chose to come to Arizona and be a part of this team. It's an exciting you know future, but I understand like addressing third base and starting pitching in other areas before they needed to address a bullpen that they did technically address at the trade deadline last year. Like if you would have picked up a Paul Seawald in the off season, then you look like you absolutely, you know, short up your, your bullpen and, and your biggest flaw, but they were able to do that at the trade deadline last year. There were a lot of jokes sure. being thrown around though, Jesse, about, you know, this is the one year where we came into into, into Diamondback spring training camp and don't get to pester Tori with the question of who's going to be your closer. Yeah, yeah, that is. Uh, you got to do that a yeah, lot Tor in the past. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Tori, Tori's already like, when he stepped up to the mic yesterday, he was like, Paul Seawald's the closer. Like, you don't even yeah. have to ask this year. Already, it's already don't decided. Even, uh, no, we're not even doing this again. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, anyway, that's, a, that's uh, a new thing. That's not exactly a situation the Diamondbacks have, have been in uh, a lot, especially, I mean, there have been yeah. some years where they did have a closer entering the season, but it didn't necessarily last very long. And then it was kind of an ongoing true. saga throughout the season. So, you know, hopefully think, for the team that, that doesn't happen this year. I think you wrote an article about their ongoing struggles uh, with with their entire bullpen situation, but mostly closers and such, right? And, and historically, yeah. their bullpen has always been bad. This this might be one of the best Diamondbacks bullpens we've ever seen in team history, you know. And that's I, I love hyperbole, but that might not. I be mean, that, that's probably not hyperbole, but it it says more <laughs> about the quality of bullpens they've had in the hey, past. If I'm being hey, honest, <laughs> no, I don't care about that part. You said anything after the butt. It was just the fact you said that's not hyperbole, and you agreed with me. But uh, <laughs> of course. We thank you guys for being here. Those of you uh, that are diehards, by the way, we thank you a whole lot for being a diehard. If you're not a diehard, you should join us because, of course, we're doing our all of our PHNX events this year. And a great way to get a discount on those events is by becoming a PHNX diehard. You get all of Jesse's content. You get the free shirt from the PHNXlocker.com, which, by the way, I had the pleasure of showing uh, Tori for the first time today the uh, We're Fucking Dangerous shirt. And let's just say... He likes it a lot and he's getting one very soon, but you can get that shirt or whatever shirt you want from the phnxlocker.com as part of your diehard membership. Of course, PHNX is taking over the Arizona versus ASU basketball game. Come with us to Desert Financial Arena on February 28th at 7 p.m. Food, drinks, tickets, and a fun game between our two college teams. Let's get down on it. Forks up. Of course, uh, get your tickets today. To click the link in the show notes or visit gophnx.com for more info. Also, speaking of fun events, you got to go check out Phoenix Raceway. I have to go check out Phoenix Raceway. Jesse, I've never been to a NASCAR race, and that is going to change on March 8th. Uh, we got our tickets to the Shriners uh, Children's 500 at Phoenix Raceway. It's March 8th through the 10th. Uh, got to go. Got to get out there. It looks like a blast. And, of course, uh, there is, don't worry, there is a Circle K right there for you to fill up on. But uh, Phoenix Raceway, it's the best in class in fan experience uh, and it meets racing's toughest drivers for three days of actions all surrounded by our beautiful state the beautiful australia mountains out there so whether you're a diehard racing fan or simply looking for a fantastic fantastic day out this event promises fun for everyone from live entertainment fan hospitality areas and immersive infield experience so get your tickets to the shriners children's 500 at phoenix raceway march 8th through 10th promises again a good weekend of a uh, whole weekend of good vibes for the whole family get your tickets now at phoenixraceway.com jesse before we get out of here of course uh big thank you all to all of you guys for being here uh this first week of spring training it's been a lot of fun neither one of us are very sunburned so that's definitely a good sign that we did our job well uh but did, we did find did out yes sunscreen both you yesterday did. and today I and did. you had a water but bottle I'm, too i'm so proud of you i know i'm really taking care of myself it occurred to me though that like uh there's like a seasonality uh element to uh like uv rays and how intense it is and like this time of year the sun isn't as brutal as it is in the summer uh if i'm if i'm not mistaken i'm not i'm no scientist but i believe that's the case so maybe i, I don't no need to wear sunscreen this time of no, year Derek. that's a bad know. idea 
I I'm so they, white they, though they, that it doesn't it doesn't really matter. I mean, it could be a, it could be like rainy and 44 degrees, and I could still get sunburned. So I probably just have to err on the side of on the side of caution. You have to take care of yourself. You have to take care of yourself. It's why Rob Manfred probably didn't come out here. It's because of how sunny it is. He doesn't want anything to do with that. He needs the humidity of Florida, but uh, he <laughs> he decided to stay over there in the Grapefruit League this year, uh, and he did announce that this will in fact be his last term as commissioner of baseball, which is really shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, but it seems to be Jesse. There seems to be some surprise from folks that, uh, that a man is going to step down from being commissioner of baseball at 70 years old. But uh, is that not the best thing for not only himself, uh, but for baseball that, that he steps down at that age? Let me, let me ask you this. I saw this in a story yesterday. Somehow I I'd never known this. What what do you think Rob Manfred makes on an annual basis? Yeah, uh, if you mm, haven't seen it, like what's your like what's your rough what's your rough guess? My rough guess would be a quarter of a million dollars a year. He <laughs> you are 000. off. You are off by a factor of a hundred <laughs> on the dot, according to a story that I saw yesterday. I think this was at Yahoo Sports. They said uh, it said reportedly. I don't know who initially reported this. But it said that Rob Manfred reportedly makes $25 million per year, uh, which I had no idea. Okay. All right. I take it money. all back, Rob. What the hell are you doing? Don't ever quit this <laughs> job. Work it until the day you die. What the hell? $25 million a year? Are you shitting me, Jesse? That's a lot of money. That is a lot, a lot of, of money. money. I thought it was going to be a more thankless job than that. There's a lot of thanks and $25 million like that. You're <laughs> thanking me quite a bit by paying me $25 million a year. Uh, I also think though that, uh, Oh wow. Groundhog mama says Goodell. Roger Goodell makes like 40 million. My goodness. Oh my um, God. Yeah. It, I business. guess it, I guess it's telling though that someone who could, you know, feasibly stay at a job like that for, quite a quite a bit longer and we saw bud seal go until his early 80s i believe uh this would put rob finishing at at age 70 um you know there's a lot of stress that comes with being the the commissioner of baseball for sure and you know i think i think rob has done some things really well you know there may be some other things the the houston astros situation comes to mind that are always going to be knocks against the the legacy that he leaves behind but yeah like he seems pretty content walking away from that. I think he put it as, you know, some one can only have so much fun uh, in this field for so long or whatnot. And uh, one can only yeah, if I were him, I'd so maybe try to stick it out for a while. But <laughs> <laughs> my God, Jesse, I just realized um, I am a mayor. So I have some government experience and then I do this baseball podcast and I report on baseball. So I have the baseball <laughs> side of things covered. Could I be? baseball commissioner how can i get where do i That's start scary. my training how do i you start do down the, the path of me getting to be baseball commissioner because 25 million dollars a year jesse is just a little more than i make here at phnx but <laughs> i don't have to send the time codes i don't have to send as many time codes as commissioner i'm pretty sure that that's handled by someone else um i don't know <laughs> I don't know. That seems like a good gig that I wouldn't, I wouldn't leave. I mean, I, I take it all back. I do think though that like, of course, uh, you know, we, we talked about this on the audio podcast we did uh, when this kind of, uh, when we first kind of discussed some of Manfred's comments and that this might be the end of the road for him. But uh, I, I think he leaves a pretty, pretty solid legacy behind. Like you said, there's some blemishes, but baseball was kind of in a bad place when he took over. And I feel like the focus has shifted. And, and baseball has kind of uh, regained its reputation a bit, you know, like there, there was a time where it was just like a bunch of steroid injected men with bats bashing baseballs millions of miles outside of stadiums and such. And that was the perception from some people of what baseball was just a, a drug filled yeah. sport that had no laws and, you know, ended up somehow in, in, you know, in hearings at Congress and things like that. But I mean, in, in the last 20, 25 years, uh, or, you know, at least during Rob Manfred's tenure, I feel like there, the focus has been more on, again, making baseball a better game, a safer game, you know, worrying a little bit more about everybody involved, including the players and the fans. And not everything has been perfect, but I do think that, you know, stepping down, he should be proud of the things that he's done and the, and, 
you know, where baseball is at uh, when he leaves it. And he still has five more years, right? So there's still plenty of time. He's, for got, him to another, mess up. he's got another CBA negotiation coming up after 2026. Oh, so he's got plenty of time to screw this up. <laughs> another, another 10 years. And yeah, there's still a long way to go uh, between well, that and the whole A's moving to Vegas situation. Yeah. And, you know, trying to figure out where expansion stands over the next five years. I know he'd like to make progress on that. So, yeah, he's still uh, he's still got his work cut out for him for sure. Yeah, I mean, Brett's right, though. We're not going to forget about MLB trying to get out of players paying uh, paying players in AZ, not just a liv livable wage, less than minimum wage. Let's not forget less than minimum wage. But that's a whole other thing. Well, we could do a whole other podcast about that. In fact, we might. So Jesse and I are going to stick around after we wrap up right now. We're going to continue to chat. Make sure not to miss that. That's going to be our audio podcast that drops on Saturday. Of course, uh, we have the most valuable party tomorrow, tomorrow out there at Chase Field. So we will hopefully see some of you guys out there uh, for those festivities as well. Uh, of course, in the meantime, you can make sure to follow us on Twitter. I am at cap underscore caveman with a K. Jesse is at Jesse and Friedman. Our show is at PHNX underscore D backs. But of course, all roads do lead to at PHNX underscore sports on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I'm not going to forget Damon. Damon Dog is here. He's in the dark right now. We don't have his video on, but you can follow Damon Dog. He is the people's producers at Damon Dog. That's D A W G at the end. We are Ryan's dogs. Bark, bark. Bark, bark. <laughs> Sorry, How dare bark. you? How Sorry, Damon. Dare you? <laughs> Sorry, Damon. <laughs> he we said it again, again today. today. We saw oh, him again yeah. today. He high-fived us and said, my dogs. And he says it just like that. I love it. I'm uh, so I know. I'm so, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, anything else we got, Jesse, before we get out of here? Oh, the, die, the Discord thing. If you're not a diehard, you missed out on us being behind the scenes today, by the way. So... Uh, we did we post think, some silly videos and Discord. We had some silly today, videos yes. of what it's like to deal with working <laughs> with Jesse and such. So make sure to check that out if you are a diehard. But of course, we'll be continuing to bring you all sorts of diehard content like that all year long. So make sure to not miss out on the full PHNX D backs experience by becoming a diehard today. And of course, get that free shirt. Of course, uh, in the meantime, we thank you guys again for your time. Uh, we hope to see you this weekend. If not, we will be back on Monday. I think we're going uh 2 p.m until baseball games start and then maybe some post game action around 5 p.m uh so make sure to keep it locked here for all of your diamondbacks coverage uh we thank you for stopping by we appreciate your time great seeing all of you guys out there at the yard today uh and of course we look forward to seeing many more of you next week uh until then make sure to have a great weekend and uh remember kids baseball is fun but it is so much more fun when you don't need a closing a closer a uh, new another closer <laughs> we all silly like the mayor 